Um, so if you wanted to share your thoughts about, I guess, some, some pending legislation that's coming before Congress here pretty soon about trade. Absolutely. So um, you'll hear people talking about the president's um, agenda on trade, and you'll hear them talk about something called TPP. What that is is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a trade deal that is being discussed um, amongst the United States, Canada, Mexico, and then the, the Asian nations um, along the, the Pacific Rim, uh, including Australia. It is a huge trade deal, um, and it's one that you know, we have to be very careful with. Um, you know, if we look at some of the trade deals like NAFTA and so forth, um, and, and some of our historic trade deals have led to, to um, job losses, led to losses in the manufacturing sector. Mostly because um, we're a very open economy here, and if we are going to negotiate trade, we should trade on a fair playing field. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I mentioned that, that I was in China recently. Um, if you look at how China operates, um, you know, we're meeting with the folks from General Motors who are, are selling cars in China. If they want to operate in China, the Chinese state-owned um, auto industry has to own at least 50% of the energy. In, in most cases, it's 55%. So they're going to control it. They won't allow, well, they'll allow General Motors to build cars here and ship them over there, but you're going to pay a 25% tax if you want to import cars. So what they're doing is they're forcing the manufacturing of cars in, um, in China. We're an open market. We don't impose those rules on other nations. That's not a fair playing field. I mean, the truth, and if you look at um, China, everything is brand new. They've got the best infrastructure in the world. They've got you know, the best, and we have to be very careful, otherwise they're gonna eat our lunch. And we're in a very competitive global environment. So that's why we are paying very close attention to these deals that are being negotiated. Um, and I'm, I'm here as someone who understands that you know, trade, when done fairly, actually can be very beneficial. 95% of the world's consumers live outside of the United States. So we do want to open up those markets. We do want to sell our goods and services. For the agricultural industry, which is so important to California's economy, 35% of our economy, and in our region, you know, the rice growers, it's incredibly important. We do want to open up, and we do want to be able to sell our goods and services to these other countries, but let's do it on a fair playing field. And you know, if you look at some of the previous trade deals that have been negotiated, they haven't been fair, and they have hurt our own economy. And you know, think about it. We growing up, we you know, if if you just think about television brands, we had Magnavox. Um, our, I'm I'm dating myself. RCA. Uh, we don't build television sets in the United States anymore. We lost whole industries, and maybe 30 years ago we could afford to do that because we were trying to help some of these um, economies and other countries build themselves in order to have a more peaceful world. Again, we're in a very competitive global economy. Our interests have to be the United States first. Our interests have to be our own workers, and that's not to sit here and say we're not going to trade with the rest of the world, but let's do it in a fair, on, on, a, on a fair playing field. And that's why um, I've been very cautious um, when you're know, talking to the administration, you're know, talking with, and really pushing that you know, these are critical deals. You're talking about you know, a trade deal that's going to be 40 or 50 percent of the world's economy. Um, that said, I would much rather the United States write these rules as opposed to China. So, thank you, Congressman. So now we've got our, our closing comments, and I'm going to go in reverse order. So we'll finish with the Congressman. So, uh, Mayor, you got uh, let's, two to three minutes to share your final thoughts. Well, I'm very glad to see we have a nice turnout today in this uh, wonderful weather. Um, we have been fortunate in many ways here in Rancho Cordova. When the kids need to have a school worked on, uh, helped, they the people here in Rancho passed a bond and it, uh, built the science building, the two-story two science building at Cordova High School. Uh, 
the economy came by and turned everything upside down, so only part of that bond was sold. So to get the uh, Performing Arts Theater, they had to get another bond. Well, people are going to have to pass that too. That's more taxes. Um, it's like everything else. When you, when you decide to buy a house, you say, let's see, is that going to be worth my while in the next 30 years? Because I'm going to be paying on that for the next 30 years. Same thing with the bond. You're going to be paying on that for that 20, 25, 30 years, whatever that bond is said. Um, taxes are, it's, it's the T word. It used to be something that you never want to talk about, ever. Uh, if you were a tax, uh, tax man, you know, you uh, um, really didn't want to knock on the door and say, I'm from the IRS. But <laughs> Um, I got one here that uh, Mark Twain said that I think seemed to fit. That the only difference between a tax man and a taxidermist is that the taxidermist leaves the skin. <laughs> so, a lot of times that seems to be it, you know. Um, but here in Escudova, we're using the taxes a very wise way, I think. You know, so it's um, something that's really uh, important to everyone here. I mean, I pay every tax. I, everything that I do, I live with. Uh, it's not like I'm not going to be uh, uh, looking from a distance. Um, I pay the, raise the taxes, well, I'm paying those taxes. That half cent sales tax, I'm paying that half cent sales tax too. The school bonds, I'm paying for every one of them, just like you are. It's something that's important to me, to help the kids, to help the city. Um, and it's so nice to be able to say this is the city. I mean, we were here in 1967 when we bought a house, and it was a very nice community and as part of the unincorporated part of Sacramento County. And we had one voice, and that was our supervisor. Now you've got five elected officials, and you vote for all five of them, and you have a voice. When we were first gathering signatures, for the incorporation of Ranch Cordova. Uh, a reporter asked me uh, the day that we were beginning to gather signatures. Um, he said, what about City Hall? You can't buy City Hall. And I said, well, yes, you can. But first you have to have the City Hall. And we didn't have one then. But now you do. And even though you don't have to fight it too hard, um, usually if you come here during the day, I'll be here. Since I retired from the phone company, this is my job. So I'm here usually, unless I'm uh, with the uh, one of the boards that I'm on representing the city, the Mosquito Vector Control Board, or the Sacramento Transportation Authority, and some of the others. But usually I'll be here. So if you have a problem and I can do something with, with it personally, or go on to our staff and get some help that way, I'll do that. But I'm glad you're here, and uh, any other questions you have, we're more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So Robert? Well, it's just great to be here today, and I thank you for coming out. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I am I had a birthday this week. I turned 62. I know that means I'm a young guy by, by certain standards. But in the institution where I serve, I'm actually, you know, sort of a fossil. Uh, I just serve with a great many more youthful members. I'm unusual because both be my law practice, which was 20 years in involved legislation in my early career, uh, this month closes out 38 years of kind of working in the legislative arena, either in the public or private sector. But I, so I have this unusual vast reservoir experience, uh, but I'm an old guy, and I'm just one of 80, and I'm, I am definitely a part of this time when the whole institution is getting turned upside down as these new members come in and we are the future. And uh, while I certainly feel from a subject matter standpoint, I'm strong on local government, I'm the expert in either house on insurance matters, I've worked on banking issues in the two houses as a consultant. There's so much of subject matter stuff which I'm very good at, but I, would, I can say clearly my passion is to be the sort of member alongside my colleagues, either really in either house, that to the extent I'm able to serve 12 years in the legislature, that the institution will be different when I am done. 
And I've already described how as soon as I got there, I started working on collaboration across the partisan boundary with my Republican colleagues and working on that. All of my staff, without fail, every staff I've hired, I've said to them, I'm not hiring you for what you're going to do for me. I'm hiring you for what you're going to do over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years in your career. And I would definitely say that they would say that I'm the sort of boss who shares lessons on how to do the work well. I'm going to sit down in the near future with my staff, and I now have a writing guide to kind of explain to my staff how to, how to, how to do writing in these sorts of jobs, to become better and better at what you do. The basic guideline in my office, which I shared yesterday with us in a staff tour, is that any of these jobs, your basic job is not to polish my apple, but it's to grow goodwill with regard to the institution. That if you're dealing with someone and you're not quite sure what to do, but you sort of see what you think would be a way to kind of bring credit to the institution by the way you conduct yourself, then, then just go and do that. And, and that's going to be all right. Uh, I've been asked this year by the Speaker of the Assembly and the Rules Chairman to help put together a class for my colleagues on how to do oversight. Because as much as members under term limits thought that the basic job was passing bills, the much greater job of the legislature is to set the state's policy. And this means they have to re-examine what are all the policies guiding the work of the executive branch? And is it the right priorities for today? Are we addressing the right issues? Are we using our state's resources to the proper ends? This is all oversight. So I would just say, um, my office is in this building. It's on the end of the hall right, uh, right down here. Anyone ever has an issue, track me down. Um, I love what I do. I consider myself a hardworking member. I certainly think people see me as thoughtful. I think my job as a member is to keep an open mind until I close it on something solid and cast my vote. That's sort of how I try to approach my duties. I recently had this Sacramento B sort of push me on an issue. And I actually said, I don't think you're right asking me to tell you today how I'm going to vote on a bill in eight months, because the deliberation hasn't yet unfolded. And I would be acting in a precipitate way to profess that I know how I'm going to vote on an issue that I know there's going to be a lot of conversation. And I always felt as a council member, serving Bob McGarvey and my other colleagues, my job was to be open to hear the debate and then decide. So that's how I hope to do my work. And uh, I thank you all for coming out, and I'll end there and I go on grand long. I think we're doing okay on time schedules. You know, I, I would, you know, before my comments, I'd like to just thank um, Bob and, and Ken, and know that the, the three of us, along with the other members of the City Council, work pretty closely together, and more importantly, um, our staffs, staffs work very closely together and you know, support one another. We don't always agree on everything, but it's important that that conversation is taking place on a regular basis. Really, again, it is about serving the community in the best possible way. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to close with this. There are a lot of issues that, um, as a nation, we are going to have to face. You know, you have a, a Middle East crisis that really is rapidly um, unraveling. You have um, terrorist threats that, uh, of the likes that we've not seen um, in ISIL and ISIS. The, these are barbarians. Um, you have, you know, tensions in um, in Russia and Ukraine. You have um, a China that's flexing its muscles in the South China Sea and so forth. And we, you know, the world is looking to America to try to address all of these issues. But the truth of the matter is addressing all these issues starts at home by addressing the issues that face our citizens and our country every day. And we need to have a strong America because the world, in order to be a more stable place, needs a strong United States of America. And that's why they look to us. We can't solve all the world's conflicts unless we first address our own issues right here at home. And that is where it has to start. And you know, I, I, when I think about the America that I grew up in, it was an America where we dreamed big. We set goals, and then we figured out how we were going to go out there and get those goals and accomplish those goals. And that's what frustrates me about Washington, D.C. right now, is we are not setting those goals. And we've got to get back to this context of, 
where we dream big and we set those goals with our children and grandchildren in mind of where we want to go as a nation. And then let's go out there and accomplish those things. And that is who we are as Americans. That is what we do. And that it truly is what the world is asking us to do, is to lead the way forward. But they've got to come with us and they've got, you know, as we address these issues, these issues are, are that, that are at the global level, we can't do by ourselves. And again, I will close with that. You know, when we talk about balancing the budget, it isn't about not spending money. It is about understanding where we're spending the resources and making sure we understand the return we're going to get on those investments. So our number one job is to be the stewards of the resources that you entrust with us, entrust us with, whether at the city, state, or at the federal level and being good stewards of those resources. And again, let's have a strong United States of America because that is what will lead the world to a more stable place. And, and that is, you know, if we just look at the, the history of the last century, that is why um, you've had this, this global growth because it starts with a strong America. So thank you. Thank you, Congressman. And thank you all for coming today. Um, this event wouldn't happen without some great people putting this all together. Could all of the assembly members and the congressman staff raise their hands? Most of the people that are standing up here, but we, let's give them a round of applause for putting this all together. Well, thank you, all three of you, to your leadership and your, your hard work for our community. Um, you're making our, our communities a better place to live, work, and play every day. Um,